Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this um, symposium on psychosis and brain disease. I think we've got a very exciting set of speakers to talk to us. And um, I chose the topic of psychosis and brain disease because I'm sure many of you will be aware that neuropsychiatric presentations in patients with neurological disorders has become increasingly common. And hallucinations are one of the symptom types that are the most difficult to manage in neurological disorders, especially in Parkinson's disease. And I think what seems to be happening is there are advanced treatments for the motor dysfunction. The natural history of the disorder is catching up with our patients and the Lewy bodies are, are moving into the cerebral cortex and we're getting presentations with psychosis, hallucinations, dementia, etc. And these are very, very difficult to manage, but are going to be free, more frequent as time goes by. Anyway, we've got a very good um, set of speakers. We've got two, two people speaking on visual hallucinations. One for the training session and one for the uh, research session, Ramona Wheel. And we've also got a data blitz session on uh, MRI findings in Parkinson's disease patients with and without hallucinations. So without further ado, I'll uh, introduce our first speaker, which, who is Ramona Wheel, who is presenting the research basic science talk on mechanisms of hallucinations in Lewy body disease. Thank you for asking me to talk at this neuropsychiatry session. These are my conflicts of interest. So I'm going to talk about mechanisms of hallucinations in Lewy body disease. And hallucinations are really common in Parkinson's disease and in Lewy body dementia. They have a prevalence of around 70% in Parkinson's and even higher in Lewy body dementia. Patients describe seeing people or animals that often at the beginning can feel can be quite benign or even friendly, but often becomes dis more distressing as disease progresses. And they're actually the strongest indicator, the strongest predictor for poor outcomes in Parkinson's disease as a very strong predictor for, for dementia and particularly for nursing home admissions. But before delving into the, the mechanisms and some of the work that we've been doing in our group, I want to share with you some of the lived experience of what patients describe uh, when, when they describe the hallucinations that they see. And to do this, uh, we formed a collaboration with a professional animator, Simon Ball, who interviewed people with uh, Lewy body dementia that we uh, connected him with. And here I'm going to play you a short 30 second clip from a film that we've made together. And this is a, a patient describing that he sees rabbits. Well, I have the sort of hallucinations of the, of the rabbits that I saw separately on a number of occasions tended to be larger, more majestic. They had a cartoonish quality to them, which made them exceptional. I mean, what I tend to experience is narrow tunnel vision almost where you know, as I chase the image the image moves and then it's gone. So if we want to understand hallucinations we need to think a little bit about vision itself and the process of vision. So here I'm showing you an image of, of a wall with kind of quite bumpy, grip, uh, bumpy bricks, but actually vision is an active process. And when you're looking at the this image of the wall, you're combining information that's coming, coming in from, from your senses, from your eyes, with also your prior experience and your, your prior knowledge. So if I show you that actually hidden inside this wall, there's actually a cigarette that's sticking out. When I next show you the wall, you'll actually be able to see that uh, cigarette, even though it's exactly the same Im image as I showed you earlier. So actually what we see is a combination of both of these. It's the incoming visual information with the top down information or our visual priors. And we can formalize that as vision being an interplay, being what we see and what we expect. <laughs> 
So we have information coming from the eyes, that's the bottom up information, and we have what we expect or our visual priors. And this is a combination of our memories or our previous knowledge. And then what we see is a combination of both of those. So the question that we wanted to ask in our group is, are hallucinations caused by changes in bottom up information or from top down dysfunction? So bottom up being information coming in from the eyes going into the brain and being processed and top down information being our memories and previous knowledge, our visual priors. So dysfunction and visual information is actually quite common in Parkinson's disease and there's now quite a lot of work from around the world that's really shown this. So Julius Anang working in, in uh, Canada has shown that patients with Parkinson's when they're asked to organise these coloured tiles, when he followed them up, he found that those who made mistakes organising the tiles were more likely to have dementia. Caroline Williams Gray, working in Cambridge, showed that patients with newly diagnosed Parkinson's, if they made errors copying intersecting pentagons, and a, a sizable proportion did, those patients were at double the risk of dementia. Working in Michigan, Nico Bonin showed that patients with Parkinson's disease, when, when imaged using PET imaging, if they, those ones who at baseline had reduced hypermetabolism at, at the back of the brain in the visual processing regions, when he then followed them up over time, they were more likely to develop Parkinson's disease dementia. And work from John Toledo, also working in the States, looking at neuropathology. So he looked at patients who had died with Parkinson's disease dementia. And if you focus on the red dotted line, those are patients who died with Lewy related pathology in the occipital cortex. And those patients, as the visual processing part of the brain, those patients developed a more rapid dementia and progression to death. And we've been doing quite a lot of work in our group looking at visual processing in Parkinson's disease. And this is some work from, from 100 patients with Parkinson's who came along to our lab, had underwent a bunch of different visual tests. And we found that when we followed them up, those patients who did badly in the visual tests were much more likely to, to develop Parkinson's disease with mild cognitive impairment. They were also more likely to drop their mini mental state examination scores after 18 month follow up and visual scores at baseline correlated with their cognition when we followed them up. So patients with Parkinson's disease are more likely to have problems with bottom up processing or their visual, uh, visual information. And then Annette Schrag has shown by comparing patients with Parkinson's disease who hallucinate with those who do not hallucinate, that those who hallucinate had greater deficits in visual processing. So the bottom up information seems to be affected in quite a lot of patients with Parkinson's disease. What about the top down information? Well, this is some work that um, Angelica Zarkali, who has been a, a PhD student in my group and is now a postdoc. So she, she looked at this and she used these uh, black and white images of, um, to, to assess this problem. Now, these black and white images are actually made from coloured images. And she, she brought patients to our lab at, at UCL and she asked people, what do you see? Do you see a person in this image? And I want you to look at this image and ask yourself, do I see a person when I'm looking at it? After she'd asked them, she then showed them the original colour image that it was made from. So when I show you that, you can clearly see that there's a cute baby sitting in a bucket. But if I then show you that original image that at first was maybe hard to interpret, you now can see very clearly that there's a baby in, in the bucket. So she invited people with Parkinson's to come along to UCL and she showed them some images with people and images without people. And she asked them, do you, do you see a person in this image? She then showed them the coloured template and then afterwards she showed them the original image. And what she wanted to see was after they had seen the coloured template, did they improve in being able to tell if there was a person in the image or not? Now, it won't surprise you that most people improved, but what she found and what was really intriguing was that when she looked at the performance after being shown that original, that color template, people with Parkinson's who hallucinated did even better and had showed an even greater improvement in performance than people who didn't hallucinate. And even more intriguingly, the amount of improvement and in, in their score correlated with how bad the hallucinations were, with their hallucination severity, measured using a clinical scale. So top-down or prior information does seem to be relevant in patients with Parkinson's disease who hallucinate. But it'd be really good to actually look at the brain and look at the connections within the brain to actually test whether there is any differences in connectivity between brain regions in hallucinators compared to non-hallucinators. So this is something that we've been, we've been doing, and this is very recent work, um, so still, still in preparation. And if you want to look at this work, please go to the poster area where George Thomas, who's my uh, PhD student, 
um, has got a poster in, in the poster area. And we did this work together with Peter Zeidman and Adil Razi. Now, if you want to look at connections and, and strength of connections in, in the brain, one of the best ways to do this is to use a, a technique called dynamic causal modeling. And we can apply this approach to resting state functional MRI data or fMRI data. Resting state fMRI data is where we ask people to come along to our lab and we, we, we introduce them, we get them to lie, lie down in the scanner and we just ask them to lie down with their eyes open for six minutes and we record the bold activity, the, the natural fluctuations of bold activity from all the different regions in the brain while they're just lying there. So to apply dynamic causal modeling, we have to select the regions of the brain that we think are most likely to be involved. And we base this on the literature that's out there of, of regions that are likely to be involved in, in Parkinson's hallucinations. So we selected prefrontal, uh, prefrontal cortex, hippocampus, medial thalamus, lateral geniculate nucleus, and primary visual cortex, or V1. And we can extract that bold fluctuations, those bold fluctuations from each of those regions as a time series. So I'm showing you here an example from a particular patient. And what you can see from, from each one that there's a bit of variation. But to be even more efficient with the calculations, it's better to convert the time series into the frequency domain. And what you can see here is that, for example, in V1, there's quite coarse fluctuations. And we can see that in the frequency domain with a peak in the black squiggly line at the lower frequencies. So for each patient, we can then take these frequencies and invert them to find the parameter that best explains these different, the, the different frequencies in each different um, brain region. And we can then look at this at a group level to compare hallucinators with non-hallucinators to see the differences in, in, the, in these frequencies. And that allows us to look at the differences in effective connectivity where effective connectivity is the causal influence between one brain region and another. So when we do this, that gives us a matrix of connections from, so outlined at the, at, at the top of this, uh, the matrix, and all those different brain regions to all those different brain regions. And we can also show this as a ball and stick. We can actually see, uh, we can display this also on, on a brain. And what we can see, so where orange is where there's uh, increased uh, connectivity and so the, the darker, the sort of um, bluer, cooler colours are uh, decreases in connectivity. And what we see is that there, uh, there's obviously a lot of differences between hallucinators and non-hallucinators, but key differences are reduced connectivity from LGN to V1, to primary visual cortex, and also to the hippocampus, and increased connectivity from prefrontal cortex to, to V1. But interestingly, we've actually found a lateralized effect. So actually from right prefrontal cortex, we got a decrease in connectivity. We then can, can perform a factorial analysis where we formally test which model is better, the bottom up model or the top down model or both between hallucinators and non hallucinators. And from this factorial analysis that takes in all the different combinations of connections into account, we found that it was this combined model that both reduced bottom up and increased bottom top down are the best explanation for the differences between hallucinators and non-hallucinators. But that's all very well that we're seeing these differences in, in effective connectivity between these brain regions and hallucinators and non-hallucinators. Does it relate to real measures and real real life information about hallucinations? So what we can do is we take the top five connections that differ between hallucinators and non-hallucinators and we can combine them and relate those to as how severe the hallucinations were, actually using the same scale that Angelica had used for the prior connection, for the, 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 the top-down uh, experiment that, that I've shown you earlier. And when we did this and when, when we combined the top five connections and, and looked at the correlations between that pattern of correlations with the severity of hallucinations, we found that there was indeed a significant correlation. So there's an association between this, this the combination of top down and bottom up, uh, effective, com effective connectivity and the severity of hallucinations. And it wasn't just the top five, we could also take the top 10 and we, we found just as much of a correlation between the effective connectivity and severity of hallucinations. So bringing this all together, I've shown you that visual processing is affected in Parkinson's disease, and it's especially affected in hallucinations. So differences in bottom-up processing. I've shown you that Parkinson's hallucinators rely more on visual priors, so differences in top-down processing. And when we looked at effective connectivity or causal influences between different brain regions, we found that actually both of these were affected. So reduced bottom-up and increased top-down connectivity is best explains differences in Parkinson's who, patients who hallucinate compared to those who don't hallucinate.
So if we go back to our previous framework of thinking about top down and bottom up, it's both. We find differences in, in the bottom up information, so reduced bottom up information and increased top down information between hallucinators and non hallucinators. So I just want to thank particularly Angelica Zarkali and George Thomas for who did most of the work that, um, that, that I've shown you today and Simon Ball who produced the beautiful uh, animation that I presented at the beginning. Thank you so much for listening and I look forward to um, hearing your questions. Thank you very much Ramona, that's wonderful work. Um, we're now open for question and answers for uh, five minutes and maybe I can start the ball rolling about asking you about insight because as you know in patients with Parkinson's disease they start off having insight into their hallucinations then as time goes on they lose insight and the hallucinations become very real and vivid to them do you have a do you have a thought about what might be going on in terms of the connections such such an interesting question and it's so true as well that, that, that very often at the beginning patients are not bothered by the hallucinations often at the right at the beginning when they first see them they also they do seem real actually but then they also get used to them so they often even go through a sort of they get used to it and then they start to feel frightening again um, I think that's a very good question what how what are the mechanisms that drive this loss of insight um, in later um, disease one of the things that we were wondering about was whether this might be a sort of metacognition that there's the patients are less good at knowing what they know and it might be a sort of change in that and that's something that we've we've looked at a little bit in our group uh, I think that the jury's still out we're still we're still not clear uh, whether it's because we haven't quite tested it in the right way or because patients with real loss of insight are quite hard to actually bring in and test actually that quite often a lot of the work that's been done on hallucinations is in sort of earlier stage um, but yeah thanks it's a very important yeah question. I mean I think in, in clinical experience you find that the patients will start talking about their hallucinations as if they're real you talk about them they're saying this they're saying that and then when you actually challenge them and say well of course I know it's my illness so there is a sort of gray area when they're losing um, metacognition about their their um, hallucinations so we've got um, a question here from Maya Ladd, say, how did neurotransmitter systems fit into the models of hallucination, sensitivity or severity? Good question. So it's a great question. And I think if the, the key neurotransmitters to think about are dopamine, aspartylcholine and serotonin. Um, I think for dopamine, that's a particularly striking one because we often have an experience of starting a patient or, or pushing up the dose or, or of, of a dopamine agonist and the hallucination is getting worse. And for me, the way that um, th that it could fit into this into this model is about the modulating salience, uh, which is Chris Fifth and, and Paul Fletcher's um, model. So that the, there is already top down um, uh, influences, but it that it sort of increases the amount of top that this sort of pushes how important the, those um, those influences are. So I think that that would be the way that I'd frame it for for dopamine. And then I think for acetylcholine and, and for serotonin, I, the, the, those uh, neurotransmitters are quite often, both of them are quite involved in the precision of, of information that comes in and precision of sensory information. So it could well be that that's where um, it, it sort of boosting acetylcholine, for example, could boost the precision of the incoming sensory information. Yeah, I'm going to skip one question and come back to that. But uh, Masood Hussain has asked, would assessment of visual priors be equivalent to the methods used to study visual priming in the memory literature using degraded figures etc but isn't that also testing bottom up complex question can you read the question Ramona can you yes, see I it can read the yeah. question and I'm just trying to get my head around it thank you <laughs> very complicated question um, I don't know if it's, it's exactly equivalent because I'm, I'm not totally familiar with the with the visual priming uh, literature and I, I think there are different ways to assess uh, visual priors because actually priors can be what you what you know already what your knowledge is what, and what your memory are um, the particular method that we used for the behavioral experiment was um, quite a nice one because it's a way of um, getting people to, to know something once they've seen an image and then once you've seen the image again you can sort of you can't unknow that but it doesn't rely on memory and that's quite nice for for an experiment you know for a study that we're looking at patients where there might be memory involvement because we don't um we don't need to rely on their memory to, to be able to see whether they how they do on the task um, and then what we were quite gratified to see in that task was that even though these, these patients some of them may 
are on the way to dementia or some of them may have the beginnings of dementia, they actually showed a greater improvement than patients without hallucinations. So it seemed to be a, a sort of useful task. Um, and, it, and it seemed to show that visual priors are important in, um, in, in, in generating hallucinations. Um, we've got Daruj, a question by Daruj asking about what's the next step, what's the next question in your research program? Well, I think a key next step is to be able to treat them. And I think that understanding some of the mechanisms is important, but what we really want to do is to treat hallucinations. And that's such a challenge. I know that David is going to talk about treatment in, in, the, um, in his talk next. Um, but one of the approaches that we're taking to treatment is uh, we're running a clinical trial at the moment, um, looking at ondansetron, which, is, uh, uh, which acts on serotonin receptors. So one of the things that we're looking at is whether um, ondansetron could be effective in treating hallucinations. Um, so that's one of the next steps that, that we're looking at. And then we've got a question from Rich Cole, who found the talk fascinating, and about the content of hallucinations. How much, how is, is the content familiar, or is it more the case that they're novel? So I, I find, and I'd be interested to know what you think, Eileen, I find that it's, that it can be either, that in fact I've had a patient that I just saw yesterday in clinic who described that sometimes she sees people that are not familiar, and then she also sees her grandchildren, so it can be mm. either. Mm. Um, but it, it is very often people um, and sometimes animals as well. Uh, why it's people, I think that's something that we don't fully understand. My thinking is that it probably suggests that the, the, the visual processing pathways that are affected are particularly those pathways that interpret people and animals, but also the presence of people is quite a salient thing for us to notice. So I think it's also that we are all as humans quite sort of primed to see people and animals anyway. So I think that's there already, but maybe that's an area that is particularly affected in, in Parkinson's as well. Yeah. And the, of course, some of the people are little people as well, aren't they? They seem to shrink in size. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So how are we doing for time, Jenny? Uh, move on, please. Okay, right. Okay. Thanks very much, Ramona. Thank you, we've, we've Thank you for having got, me. We've now got a data blitz session on visual hallucinations by Marcella Montanesi. Do you want to start the, the video of that three minute data blitz? Hi, everyone. My name is Marcella, and I'm really glad to be here to present this work on resting state network in Parkinson's disease psychosis. Now, I'd like to begin with this image of an iceberg to illustrate that when we think of Parkinson's disease, we might think of patients experiencing widely known motor symptoms, such as tremor or slowness of movement. But actually, these are just the tip of the iceberg, because patients often have other symptoms, uh, including psychosis. And Parkinson's psychosis is much more common than people realize, with almost half of Parkinson's patients experiencing these symptoms. So for the current work, we decided to explore resting state fMRI data from the PPMI cohort, and I will show you the main results from our network-based statistics analysis, uh, which is a method that avoids the problem of multiple comparisons during mass univariate tests by estimating uh, statistical significance for a subset of mutually connected uh, network nodes. So our results show that there was a network of 22 nodes and 23 edges, whereby the hallucinators had lower functional connectivity than the known hallucinators. By using a connectogram, um, you can visualize how the edges are distributed across the different canonical uh, Yale functional networks. Uh, interestingly, I think we see that a large proportion of them are between the somatomoto and the default mode network as well as between the default mode network and both the ventral and the dorsal attentional networks, which are all really important key networks in most current models of Parkinson's psychosis. We also ran sensitivity analysis to rule out that perhaps the significant results were driven by differences in disease severity between the groups and alongside also key other variables, but the results remain robust. Secondly, we then found that the average connectivity from this significant subnetwork was related to cognitive performance for those with hallucinations, but not for the non-hallucinators. And specifically, this was in terms of episodic memory and different tests of executive function. And importantly, I should say that the groups did not differ in performance on these tests. And lastly, in the hallucinations group, the average MBS connectivity was also positively related to the levels of beta amyloid in the cerebrospinal fluid, which is a marker of dementia. 
Finally, we then thought that it would be nice to see if a similar network could be replicated in a different data set. Uh, now, before matching the replication cohort to our original data set, this was not replicated. But after we matched the patients to our original cohort in terms of disease severity and key demographics, we found a very similar network, which you can see on the right hand side. And importantly, the fact that we replicated this result after matching patients, especially in terms of early disease severity, could indicate that maybe this is a network seen in those uh, relatively early stages of Parkinson's who experience hallucinations. In future work, we hope to dwell deeper and try to understand this network better. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. The, uh, we've got two minutes for questions. Um, any questions coming up through the chat? No, um, maybe I can, can ask a question about I suppose it's really about how that matches up with what uh, Ramona was saying. Do you have any thoughts about that? So we haven't, so because this, the PPMI data set was not uh, specifically looking at Parkinson's patients with hallucinations, there are a lot of key measures that I think um, are not available that would have been able to, um, we, we could have, you know, dwelled deeper in and to see how they relate with um you know what Ramona talked about um, and so that there's I think is a bit of a limitation um, but it's interesting I think the to look at the disease severity the link you know whether we look at early on uh, stages and whether the hallucinations are more complex or whether they're more kind of uh, towards the illusion side I think that does have uh, an effect. And in, in your um, in your study do you have any mechanistic views about what might be causing the differences that you're finding is that that's not you're not there yet <laughs> we're not there yet but um we are now trying to bring this mbs results more towards the gene expression and also looking at receptor maps to kind of link that with more mechanistic insight and hopefully we will have a better idea okay thank you very much indeed i think we can move on now to the next thanks a lot that was lovely um we can move on to um the teaching talk which um, is going to be presented by David Okai, who is a neuropsychiatrist at King's. And he's going to tell us how to manage hallucinations and Parkinson's disease, hopefully. Over to you, David. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for giving, asking me to talk. Uh, can you hear me? Um, okay, these are the learning objectives for the talk. And it's often useful to start off with a case presentation. So here is a lady, Miss LD, a 47-year-old with a four-year history of idiopathic Parkinson's disease, an ex-headmistress being considered and referred to my service for consideration for DBS. Recent psychotic episode, uh, but she was still actively psychotic with the belief that she'd been drugged by her husband and that her husband was having an affair. Quite marked um, uh, motor instability in the context of Parkinson's disease, um, which was affecting her work as well. And this was, uh, I often divide things up into whether the percentage of time that they're motorically on and off and dyskinetic. You can see that her function was poor. When she presented, it wouldn't be psychiatry if we didn't do a mental state, but she was dressed in perfectly matching blue. She was over talkative um, and the belief about her husband was delusional in nature. This is what we suggested to reduce her apinarol, the dopamine agonist, uh, to stop her citalopram because she wasn't depressed, um, to look at the option of quetiapine uh, first line as a generic management plan. In her case, she was already on it. It was about increasing that up uh, and then thinking about cholinesterase inhibitor or clozapine as second line as well. I said DBS was contraindicated on psychological grounds. And we spoke about all the other things that come along with psychosis. And so just to talk a bit about psychosis in Parkinson's, um, you can see, and this I even alluded to this in her question, that actually uh, the um, illusions and the hallucinations can be associated with variable insight. Now, of course, we are talking about um, uh, the NINDS criteria for psychosis when we're, when we're referencing it in relation to Parkinson's disease because there is no ICD-10 criteria for this. And in fact, the influence of um, uh, Parkinson's medications would mean that it's quite difficult to classify from that perspective. And here you can see a case on the left of someone who um, had Parkinson's and kept on seeing faces in the context of the flowers and someone who was also seeing insects in the context of um, uh, of the rug there. I had a patient who was seeing extremely distressing 
uh, monsters in her pillows. And what was the solution to that? We turned the pillows round. Uh, the other sides didn't have buttons on and she was no longer uh, uh, bothered by them. They can be quite distressing, these uh, hallucinations, if in, in the context of insight, but um, in context of lack of insight. But when they do have insight as well, they're still um, felt to be quite variable in how they present. They can be quite markedly different um, from um, individual to individual, as Ramona mentioned before. And of course, there is an association with um, uh, cognition as well, with a progression in cognition, uh, it, with a progression in their, their frequency as um, someone's cognition starts to decline. The two most common types are um, a delusion of presence, and I'll come on to that in a bit later, and then a delusion of infidelity as well. So they can be complex and comforting as well. And here uh, we mentioned this idea of a passage uh, or presence delusion as well, uh, both of which are very, very common in the context of the epidemiology and then um, a delusion of infidelity on top of that. So what's going on in the context of this? I don't know if you can see my um, uh, cursor, but it's well known that alpha synuclein pathology is um, the hallmark um, agent in the context of, of Parkinson's. And it tends to start off in the brain stem, uh, affecting the substantia, nigra, ni the substantia nigra, as we know, for movement disability. But Brock, um, in his post-mortem sort of studies, um, looked at the progression of alpha synuclein pathology and correlated that with clinical presentations. And what he and his subdivision of the severities of Parkinson's was very much based on that, with a progression of the alpha synuclein pathology over time. Here you can see it starts off in the brain stem and then rapidly sp uh, spreads to the occipital lobe over the course of um, months to years, oftentimes years, uh, but also progression into the orbitofrontal and uh, ventromedial sort of uh, cortex as well and eventually in the latter stages there's a progression to the entirety of the cortex at which point in time from the cognitive perspective the condition is virtually indistinguishable from an Alzheimer's picture. However as I mentioned before when you've got involvement of the occipital lobe <coughs> oftentimes you get hallucinations which can be quite distorted and so um, this idea of Lilliputian hallucinations it lends itself to the idea of a dysmegalopsia but actually the, they might be men or women, but they're shrunk in time and the brain with its high order cortical processing interprets that as they must be children because they're smaller than I would expect to see for average from that perspective. And, and in the case that I presented, there was some suggestion of personality change with the lady as well. And that may well be related to autofrontal involvement. I think it's really important to take a step back and just think about this in the context of um, uh, of psychosis and what is known in this well researched area of psychosis in non Parkinson's. And th there's this idea of dopamine sensitivity is key to that, of, but one of course various other monoamine oxidase, so monoamines are involved as well. Um, and so this idea of dopamine sensitization nonetheless still remains as, as key and central to the concept. Um, and what we see is that the individuals who have park, uh, who have psychosis in um, in the general population uh, sometimes have problems as children. Sometimes they're clumsy. Sometimes they have slow um, sl uh, some difficulties with learning, etc. But none of these are uh, particularly predictive of developing a psychotic episode. As time goes on, there is a sense of a change, usually around um, uh, you know sort of the eighteen to twenty five year old age group. Um, leading eventually to a psychotic state. The phenomenology is fascinating, but actually many a time people present with a perplexed state. They become confused. They know that something's not quite right in the context of this escalating dose of dopamine. Um, and then as time goes on, that building become, that, that sense becomes increasingly dysphoric. And then eventually, for instance, someone walks past them in the street and just happens to look at them and almost associated with a sense of relief. They go, oh, I know what's wrong. It's that the CIA are chasing me. And that, that's, that, church, that person who just looked at me was a member of the CIA. And you get this secondary delusional elaboration to that. But Shitish Kapoor and, and uh, Ramona mentioned this in her talk, um, uh, have, has, have taken to referring to this hypersalient syndrome, dopamine being the neurotransmitter to do with importance and new learning. And, and I think that's got huge implications. So imagine if we moved to a 
a reference to psychosis that wasn't based on schizophrenia, which doesn't mean a huge amount to most people, but were able to refer to it as a hypersalience disorder. I think that would have um, quite marked implications. Sorry, it's going far too much. Uh, in a general state, you'd be able to say, I have a hypersalience disorder. Um, I take this medication, uh, which is in, which cuts down on dopamine, which is the chemical of importance. Uh, and that's why I believe things that no one else believes from time to time. Um, they do this in Japan, and it has a huge difference on the view of psychosis in Japan compared to um, many other countries where it's still, in many ways, viewed as a bit of a negative term. In terms of risk factors for hallucinations, this has been well studied, and there are a whole range of them, um, which you can see here listed um, as well. Levodopid dose is a very difficult one, because if these are cross-sectional studies and you um, catch people with psychosis, inevitably, inevitably someone else has caught someone with a psychosis and may, for instance, have started to reduce their levodopa dose already in the context of this cross-sectional study, unless it's a prospective study. Um, it's important to recognise that these symptoms can occur in drug-naive patients, in fact, and previously the thinking was that they were relatively rare. That doesn't seem to be the case when you look at it in an organised way, but the beauty of this study is that they had a deep think about what um, Parkinson's psychosis might look like and recognise that it's, it may not be subject to the same standard um, severity assessments or screening assessments that you might see in the general population. And the prognosis, I think this, when I, when I looked into this data, I was quite surprised um, by the level of impact of the presence of a psychosis in terms of prognosis. And here you can see that for nursing home placements, the mortality is quite marked for those who have the um, psychosis um, over um, the ensuing two years. I must say it's got better. These are, the old, these are old studies and, and there are more recent studies that have shown that perhaps it's a little bit better than it was then. But it was still quite shocking to see the the the, the, the level of, um, uh, of of associated uh, mortality. So how do we treat this condition? I, I wouldn't be doing my job as a psychiatrist if we didn't talk about the psychosocial component to this. And uh, I do a few things. The first is to check the time of the onset of the symptoms and see if there's um, some something about that that can be helped. Um, sometimes people become quite agitated around the time of the onset and it's, it, it's possible to think about psychotropic prescribing in anticipation of that. If there's a dosing effect whereby reliably, for instance, people become psychotic around five or six o'clock, in fact, that's happened to more than a few of my patients, um, we sometimes think about prescribing um, an antipsychotic just a little bit before that. Technically, an antipsychotic uh, time frame should last the whole day, so I don't know why that works, but it does seem successful in a proportion. And of course, if there's agitation associated with it, you can think about medications that might help from that perspective. Sleep is key and getting good sleep habits is encouraged, although that's not often necessarily um, possible. Remember when I was talking about bra staging, you can see that the reticular activating system is involved at a very early stage. And so sleep is inherently uh, difficult in the context of Parkinson's, but we still try to get people to practice good sleep hygiene as well. Remember I mentioned with the um, patient who was seeing the pillows to turn them around, there are a whole range of other options that can be done to try and do that. I'm not suggesting that someone should have their carpet uh, taken up to find a lighter sort of beige carpet that doesn't have any sort of patterns in it. But there are a whole, way, a whole range of ways of thinking about the environment you're in to think about changing those um, in a more favourable way or even moving into another room around a certain time if you know that the visual hallucinations are um are, are uh, reliably at a certain time as well what some patients we had with a reduplicative amnesia have done surprisingly well with an agreement between themselves and their spouse about um certain key things to remind the person who the spouse is so if you think that your spouse turned into another person why not you know maybe you'll recognize that if you look at their wedding ring that they that, you know and it's white gold for instance that that must still be your partner even if you're confused uh, in the context of uh, the moment as well. And then there's something about just the psychoeducation component to the, pres to the presentation, normalizing the presence of psychosis. I've given you the um, frequency in terms of epidemiology and even patients knowing that this is a relatively common uh, circumstance as time goes on over the progression of the, the disorder is, is sometimes key. In terms of carers, people often ask about this, but if it's, if you had 
a patient who had a dementia and they thought it was a Tuesday and you knew it was a Thursday, you might correct them on the first go. And maybe you'd even try again on the second go. But if you saw it was causing agitation and distress, you wouldn't keep on arguing with them about the day. You would um, quietly relent and say, OK, well, then maybe, maybe it's Tuesday um, from your perspective. And I think it's important to be able to recognise that one needn't push too hard uh, if if someone is caught up in the moment of these of these uh, episodes, and as you as you know, they come with variable insight, and maybe later on the patient will be able to reflect. Uh, and and actually, of course, the, the one of the main pillars of a patient's care is their spouse, so we need to make sure that we're looking after them well. And then, in terms of medications, the first thing to do is to to look at rationalising what medications they have. Uh, it's surprising how many people, for example, are, are on amitriptyline for something else. That type of thing needs to come off. Um, and the, the range of adjunct psychotropic medications should be reviewed and um, certainly reviewed in the context of <coughs> psychosis, trying to keep them on, um, you know, a sing, you know, a single lever, lever um, dopaminergic, sorry, lever dopa agent if at all possible as well. Uh, dopamine agonists are by far a, a, um, a, a increased relative risk ratio of, of the development of this range of conditions with quite a strong uh, alteration to effect. So um, they should be removed in the context of this. And then you find that you're at that difficult period of the fine balancing act between um, maintaining their motor function and treating the psychosis. So it may be that the sacrifices are worsened motor function for some of these patients in order to treat the psychosis, which may be more distressing to them than not being able to um, get up as easily as before. Um, in terms of uh, PD psychosis, there are a whole range of trials in this area. Um, and the, the, the take home message here, given our limited time, is risperidone and lanzapine not to be avoided as they quite markedly worsen side effects. And don't forget, these are major tranquilizers, so they can have quite marked impacts. And what are we actually worried about with a dopamine blocking agent? The, the potential risk is that of death. I didn't have time to put a, a slide in on, on the mortality associated with um, Parkinson's in the context of, in the context of and psychotics. But, um, and of course, it's a complex picture because by the time you develop psychosis, your, your mortality is likely to increase anyway. But it's quite striking to see the time frame, um, the temporal time frame from some people being started on and psychotic and, and their time to death. And, of course, again, it may be that people were close to death and they were becoming agitated already, but it, the caution um, to, and, and the deep think about which of the two medications you would give. There are five RCTs looking at quetiapine in the context of um, Parkinson's psychosis, um, and they have largely had a, neg a negative outcome. However, um, there are five trials looking at, with 169 patients in total. That means an average of about 30 patients per trial which means that almost by definition, you're looking at um, trials that are under, fun sorry, under, under um, powered in order to defect a, uh, detect a strong difference. That range, of course, varies. Um, but looking at the trials that we're doing, for example, in Parkinson's now, for instance, Parkinson's um, and uh, depression, the, the numbers are significantly higher than that. Um, 169 patients would be one treatment arm, for instance. Um, so I think that's important to bear in mind from that perspective. There is also something possibly about um, the rating scales that are used in these trials, which I think needs to be looked at, and I'll come on to that in a bit as well. Uh, at the top of the list, you'll see that uh, clozapine um, has also been used in the context of Parkinson's, and that is felt to be um, far more effective in terms of use. Um, most people would echo that. People get scared about this idea of a granular cytosis in the context of, of um, clozapine or other risk factors such as um, the potential for changes in blood pressure. But we're talking about really do low doses of clozapine, somewhere in the realms of 6.25 through to about 37.5 um, to have a, a, a good treatment effect. The, the one thing I would say is that it's never as simple as you'd think, because NICE, of course, says first line you should use um, quetiapine. Why did they come to that conclusion? It's because there are a range of subset trials which haven't shown a difference. So here you have a trial comparing uh, quetiapine versus clozapine, and actually there's no difference in CGI at the five-month period between the comparators of the two antipsychotics. 
uh, and similarly um, there's another study by Morganti, again a relatively old style looking at the comparison between quetiapine and clozapine and again uh, they found no difference in terms of um, psychotic psychosis at that uh, at that time. The cholinesterase inhibitors um, are felt to be beneficial in the context of psychosis and um, it, of course the primary outcome measure is always cognition in the context of these um, of, of these psychotropics but secondary outcome measures have repeatedly proven a modest treatment effect um, so something to bear in mind oops Oh, something to bear in mind um, and I must say for my own clinical practice either quetiapine or um, a cholinesterase inhibitor such as rivastigmine I very, very rarely have to, uh, a need to move on to clozapine and in the last five years I probably used clozapine two or three times. Uh, we need to move on soon yeah. David if we can wrap up. Yeah, well, this is my last study, which is just um, this is only uh, licensed in in the states. A um, pimavacin pim in a, a serotonin receptor inverse agonist. Um, of note of this uh, study uh, of this medication, it failed in its first three randomized control trials, showing no improvement in its primary end um, point of this SAPS uh, the scale for the assessment of positive symptoms. But then uh, the developers refined the endpoint before launching a fourth trial, focusing the scale on items of most clinical relevance to Parkinson's disease, which I think is an important thing. There are no validated psychosis trials for Parkinson's as far as, far as, I'm, uh, as, far as I'm aware, at which point in time they, they found a, a beneficial effect as well. So how happened to our lady two years on? She's, uh, she was still psychotic um, and not suitable as a candidate for DBS as well. Um, she remained on large doses of clozapine, which had some benefit in her case, but I don't think that she's typical uh, of, of cases that come through the door from a secondary and tertiary care perspective. Um, and it, of course, the cases that might come to psychiatry might be different from those that come to neurology as well. Why is this important? For all the reasons that I've stated there as well. Uh, I Ramona mentioned her own trial on Andanzatron looking in the context of um, uh, you know, sort of Parkinson's psychosis and again something to think about as well. These are the uh, topics we covered in the context of the talk. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, David. I think we don't have time for Q&As, um, but if we've got any time at the end, we can do take some Q&As. And also I've been asked to tell you that um, the website is still open and it'll be open for two more weeks and other questions will be posted on that website um, for you to interact with. So please do go and have a look. All right. It's going to be by Tom Pollack, who has asked me to give apologies because he has COVID and won't be able to um, sit in for the question and answers. So if we can start with his video now and then see how much time we have at the end of the session, please. Hi, my name is Tom Pollack. I'm an NIHR clinical lecturer at King's College London and an honorary consultant neuropsychiatrist uh, working at South London and Mortley NHS Foundation Trust. Thank you so much for the organisers of this conference uh, for inviting me to talk about autoimmune psychosis towards diagnosis and treatment. I have no conflict of interest to declare. So I'd like to start by discussing a problem. This is a clinical problem, and I think one that applies equally to psychiatrists as it does to neurologists. And that's the experience of increasing demand coming from patients and their families to investigate for autoimmune or inflammatory causes uh, for psychosis, either in themselves or in a loved one. And I think part of the reason is that some of these autoimmune brain disorders are very much in the, 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 the public imagination at the moment. But also I think there is... Partly a motivation that's to do with potentially stigma against psychiatric diagnoses in, in the culture at large. I think the problem is, is that without clear criteria of how to diagnose these disorders, there are real dangers. Where do we stop investigations, for example? Um, and of course, this could all lead to uh, the inappropriate uh, immunotherapy. And we, we know that uh, immunotherapy is certainly not without its dangers, particularly in the current uh, climate. So we need to be clear on which patients do not require immunotherapy. But just if you needed evidence that in the culture at large, there are concerns around these kinds of disorders, uh, I 
took the liberty of uh, looking at the Daily Mail or the Mail Online for all the headlines around autoimmune encephalitis. They've been around 25 or 30 to date, and this is a selection. Uh, see if a few themes come through. They said I was just putting it on. A teen who suffered terrifying seizures that made her hallucinate was told that's not how seizures work by psychologists before being diagnosed with a rare brain disease. Teenage girl was convinced she was a dinosaur or a monkey in just hours from death when doctors discovered her brain was under attack from a rare illness. Sufferers of schizophrenia may have a treatable immune disorder that could be completely cured. Woman, 30, misdiagnosed with schizophrenia after a rare immune disease stopped her from sleeping for 10 days and triggered hallucinations that she was being chased by Mexican drug lords. I told my boyfriend I'm a monkey and I'm going to the zoo. A woman who was nearly sectioned, that means involuntarily detained, over her hallucinations, in fact, has a rare condition that causes her immune system to attack her brain. Now, apart from the sensationalist nature of some of these headlines, there's clearly it's getting at a concern that either oneself or one's loved ones might end up being locked away in a psychiatric hospital, for example, when in fact they have some sort of autoimmune, potentially immunotherapy responsive brain disease that might otherwise be missed. And this is a question that Susanna Cahillon asks in her book, Brain on Fire, which is an account of her autoimmune psychosis that occurred in, in, in her 20s, uh, in, in the mid 2000s which was eventually diagnosed as NMDA receptor encephalitis. She asks, how many people are currently in psychiatric wards and in nursing homes being denied the relatively simple cure of steroids, plasma exchange, or more intense immunotherapy? So keep that problem in mind. Now, now there's another problem. Uh, this diagram is from my colleague Esther Coutinho, and it shows the development of um, the identification of some of these autoimmune encephalitides uh, that are characterized by antibodies to neuronal surface antigens. And you can see since the initial identification of voltage-gated potassium channel encephalitis in 2001, but really sort of culminate, the climaxing with the discovery of NMDA receptor encephalitis in 2007, new forms of encephalitis are being discovered. And each tends to be characterized by antibodies to, at least initially, very familiar neurotransmitter receptors. So it's sort of unsurprising that if these antibodies attack these neurotransmitter receptors causing receptor hypofunction, that potentially that's going to create psychiatric symptoms and sometimes very profound psychiatric symptoms alongside the eventual development of neurological features. So things like seizures, cognitive dysfunction and movement disorders. But to date, there have been hundreds of so-called isolated psychiatric cases that have been described. And these are mainly case reports and small series. And if immunotherapies are given, they're always given open label. There are no randomized controlled trials in this uh, area. But the problem is if we only test for autoimmune encephalitis in those patients that look frankly encephalopathic with all these neurological features, we might miss these attenuated presentations. And until recently, these disorders were defined by the presence of an antibody, which potentially delays treatment and leads to avoidable morbidity. And this is just to emphasize in NMDA receptor encephalitis, at least, that if you're an adult, if you're over 18, 75% uh, of patients with this disorder will present with uh, problems with their behavior, their cognition or memory deficits. So essentially with some sort of psychiatric or psych psychiatry relevant presenting feature. And in the initial case series, at least around 80% of patients initially presented to psychiatric services. This didn't mean they were given a psychiatric diagnosis, but the first sort of line of, of, of clinicians who saw these people um, were people working in mental health services. And in fact, in some of these early series, it was shown that a proportion of patients with this disorder presented with only uh, psychiatric symptoms. And indeed, at relapse, around a quarter of patients with this disorder uh, present with psychiatric symptoms or psychotic symptoms only. So it's an important thing for psychiatrists to spot. And I'm sure many psychiatrists listening to this uh, talk will have experience of this disorder. But should we believe everything that we read in the journals about autoimmune encephalitis? Because really, it's been claimed to be responsible for a pretty baffling array of psychiatric presentations. You just need to look at some of these titles of papers to see that really these antibodies are being blamed for a, a, a vast number of different presentations. And actually, these papers are some of the more convincing ones. There, there are a lot out there where simply an antibody is measured in the blood of a patient with a particular psychiatric presentation and some sort of causal connection is being claimed. In order to try and clear some of the mess up, um, uh, colleagues in Freiburg in Germany, uh, along with myself, along with uh, Belinda Lennox and other colleagues, um, went through the literature to look at patients' 
presenting with an autoantibody associated psychiatric syndrome. And there was a reasonably high threshold for inclusion here. There had to be some kind of immunotherapy response or at least some sort of um, evidence of CNS inflammation beyond just a, a blood antibody. And you can see that there were 145 patients who were identified, 64% were female, mean age was around 44 years old. Most of the patients had neuronal cell surface antibodies, most frequently to the NMDA receptor. And schizophrenia-like and sort of dementia-like presentations were among the most frequently reported with about a third each. And you can see that uh, when immunomodulatory treatment was performed in around 87% of the cases, the vast majority of patients responded to treatment. Again, of course, this comes with all the provisos and, and the warnings that case series and case reports uh, have, should have with them. But it does raise the question of how common is autoantibody associated psychosis. And around the same time that uh, Susanna Cahalan was asking that question, uh, a group of researchers led by Belinda Lennox, along with Angela Vincent, Mike Zandi, Sarosh Irani, Alistair Coles, um, and others um, asked whether these potentially uh, disease relevant antibodies were present in patients with first episode of psychosis attending a community first episode psychosis service. So these are patients who are probably well enough to walk in and out. And they found that around six or seven percent of these patients had potentially relevant antibodies, the NMDA receptor and the VGKC um, antibodies. Um, and one patient who they treated with plasmapheresis followed by steroids got well enough not to require any further treatment. And if you're interested in the way in which this literature is going, you might want to consider that as a kind of patient zero. And interestingly, the patients with the antibodies were not distinguishable on clinical grounds alone from the patients without the antibodies. Since then, there have been a lot of studies measuring the prevalence of these antibodies in patients with psychosis and comparing them to other kinds of control groups, healthy controls, other psychiatric controls, uh, neurological controls. And to summarize the literature, it's actually a little bit of a mess when you look at the serum, uh, the blood antibodies only. And um, I conducted two meta-analyses separated by around seven years uh, to look at uh, this question. And in the most recent meta-analysis, it actually turns out that there doesn't appear to be a difference between the prevalence of these antibodies in patients with psychosis uh, versus healthy controls. However, if you look at the kind of uh, assay which is used to detect these antibodies, there does appear to be an effect of assay type such that assays using the live cell based assay are more likely to find a case control difference. But nonetheless, the overall picture is that in terms of uh, discriminatory power, these blood-based antibodies do not appear to be particularly useful clinically. So that's a problem, right? Because there was a time, perhaps eight or so years ago, when psychiatrists were very excited that all we had to do was measure these antibodies in our patients, uh, and we've suddenly identified some form, form of immunotherapy responsive psychosis, and we can call a friendly neurologist uh, who's going to perform IVIG or, or, or plasma exchange and make our patients better. Unfortunately, like so much of biological psychiatry, things are not that straightforward. This is a study looking at a first episode psychosis cohort that I uh, led. Um, and we found that patients with NMDA receptor antibodies actually had an identical symptom profile in terms of symptom severity, um, and also in terms of uh, response to treatment as patients who didn't have these antibodies. All patients were treated with amisulpride and antipsychotic, and the patients without the antibodies uh, did exactly the same as the patients with the antibodies. In fact, the only clinical discriminator uh, between these patients was the duration of psychosis, where patients with the antibodies appeared to have a shorter duration of psychosis than patients without the antibodies. And a similar finding has been uh, shown in a number of studies, and I guess the significance of that is not quite clear yet. But it's clear that we cannot be basing too much on the presence of a blood antibody alone. Nonetheless, antibodies uh, purified from the blood of patients with first episode psychosis appear to have some sort of pathogenic potential. This is work from colleagues uh, in Bordeaux that we were involved with. This is uh, from Laurent Grock's group, um, led by uh, Julie Jezekel, who showed that antibodies purified from patients with a first episode psych of psychosis uh, were able to dynamically disrupt the NMDA receptor in a way which was comparable to antibodies uh, purified from patients with NMDA receptor encephalitis. Um, and more than that, if you looked at the effects of antibodies from healthy people who had NMDA receptor antibodies, as we know a small proportion have, they didn't seem to elicit the same degree of dynamic disorganization of the NMDA receptor um, as antibodies taken from the patient with first episode psychosis. So these antibodies clearly have some sort of pathogenic potential, 
is the problem that we shouldn't be looking for these antibodies in the blood, but we should be looking for them in the CSF? Well, there was a, paper, a study a few years ago which purported to answer this question in Australia. And participants here were recruited from mental health units in Queensland, in Northern Australia. And they were included in the study if they were definitively suffering from a psychotic disorder, including substance-induced psychotic disorder. And they were tested for um, serum antineuronal antibodies. And if they were positive for serum antibodies, then a lumbar puncture was performed to see whether there was any evidence of CNS inflammation. And what's really interesting in this study, and I'm looking here at the, the top table and the first four patients here, these are the patients who had serum NMDA receptor antibodies present. The first two patients actually went on to become encephalopathic. Um, and you can see very clearly they have an inflammatory CSF, they have a lymphocytic cleocytosis, they have uh, antibody present in their CSF. Patients three and four, however, didn't go on to become encephalopathic. They remain sort of purely psychiatric, as it were. But nonetheless, there is clear evidence of CSS, CSF inflammation um, in these patients. And in fact, all patients were treated with immunotherapy, and all patients made a, a very good recovery, and they didn't require further immunotherapy or uh, further psychiatric or antipsychotic treatment, suggesting that maybe screening patients for serum antibodies is a good idea, if only because it can then direct who we should be uh, performing a lumbar puncture on. However, two recent studies have, have potentially cast some doubt on that because these studies have uh, measured antibodies in both serum and CSF, and have shown that not only is the presence of a serum antibody not a good guide to the presence of an antibody in the CSF, but in fact, uh, CSF and MDA receptor antibodies are very, very unusual. So we're in a bit of a complicated situation clinically where there's a real question about who we should be screening. A number of years ago, we uh, published a series of um, well, an international consensus guidelines um, for the diagnosis and management of autoimmune psychosis with a view of making life a bit easier for psychiatrists because while existing guidelines did exist for the diagnosis of autoimmune encephalitis, they were very much based on the premise that things like an MRI, a lumbar puncture and an EEG had already been performed. And of course, you just could need to speak to any psychiatrist to know that it's going to be very, very difficult to get all those investigations done uh, on every patient who walks through your door presenting with psychosis. And so this was a set of uh, criteria which we hoped were going to be very useful for psychiatrists and um, appear to have been quite useful. So there are three sets of, uh, there are three thresholds. Uh, possible autoimmune psychosis uh, is met when a patient presents with one out of seven red flag signs suggesting the presence of an autoimmune CNS disorder. If they have, any of these red flag signs and they have a subacute onset of psychosis less than three months, then these are the patients that as a psychiatrist you should be ordering MRI, EEG or lumbar puncture for. And if any of these investigations uh, reveal abnormalities um, as described in the criteria for probable autoimmune psychosis, then you can consider uh, treating with immunotherapy. But the important thing is here that a serum antibody alone is in no way sufficient to lead to a diagnosis of autoimmune psychosis. You need extra paraclinical evidence. You need that lumbar puncture. You need the MRI. You need the EEG. And just very recently, there's in fact, uh, in the last week, a very useful paper that's come up from the group of uh, Josep Dalmau showing that we may have another biomarker, which could be very useful in the diagnosis of autoimmune psychosis. Um, the, they looked at um, serum neurofilament light chain levels uh, in patients with NMDA receptor encephalitis, including those who presented solely psychiatrically with just isolated psychosis, and compared these levels to patients presenting with a, a primary psychiatric first episode of psychosis. And they found that young patients with uh, neurofilament light levels uh, higher than 15 picograms per milliliter had a 120 times higher chance of having NMDA receptor encephalitis than having a primary psychiatric cause of their psychosis. And this cutoff level correctly classified 96% of primary psychosis and 85% of NMDA receptor encephalitis with isolated psychosis, suggesting there's probably a very important role uh, for neurofilament light uh, testing uh, going forward. And of course, this is very useful because it's a serum test. Um, so hopefully there'll be some uh, light shed on the, the utility of this in everyday clinical practice soon. I think there's an opportunity for a more nuanced conversation as well. 
Um, this was a study from a few years ago published in Molecular Psychiatry, where we asked whether these antibodies, when they're detected in patients at high risk for psychosis, so these patients who already have prodromal signs and symptoms of psychosis, whether these antibodies might predict so-called transition to psychosis. In fact, they didn't, but what they did associate with was the presence of cognitive impairment um, in these patients. Uh, not only that, but they associated with depressed mood. And that's very consistent with an emerging literature that these antibodies may have a role as biomarkers of some aspect of the phenotype. And this might actually be relevant transdiagnostically, not just in psychosis. So there's some really interesting work coming from the group of Kasten Finke in Berlin, showing that in patients with cancer, these antibodies associate with cognitive impairment. Um, there's a lot of work in dementia and in, in, in stroke, for example, that seems to suggest similar things. We've reviewed this uh, in translational psychiatry in that article at the bottom. And in fact, we have some evidence in submission at the moment suggesting that these antibodies in Parkinson's disease might show some association with poorer cognitive trajectories in Parkinson's disease. So I think this is an area that's potentially very interesting. So rather than these antibodies being the primary cause of a particular psychiatric phenotype or cognitive phenotype, uh, they, they, they may uh, modify some aspect of that phenotype. So to conclude, autoimmune encephalitis can present rarely as indistinguishable from a primary psychotic disorder, but these antibodies are likely to have relevance beyond autoimmune encephalitis. The serum antibodies, however, are likely to be unlikely to be of much clinical use on their own, and CSF analysis may need to be a lot more common in psychiatry. The distinction between a pathogenic and a non-pathogenic antibody may be a little bit too simplistic, and there's a, a role to look at these antibodies as, as, as disease modifiers or indeed biomarkers of, of some aspect of the phenotype. We need treatment trials to look at the role of immunotherapies in patients who have these antibodies and uh, the SYNAPS2 trial being led by Belinda Lennox in Oxford is a fantastic example of this. But also we need to be looking at autoimmunity and psychosis beyond the single antibody approach, uh, looking at identification of novel antigens, but also autoantibody repertoires. There's an increasing interest in T cells. Um, and also the immunogenetic basis. There's a lot of other evidence, which I couldn't tell you today, uh, about the role and potential risk factors relating to autoimmunity and psychosis. And we need to somehow relate that to the more specific literature focusing on autoantibodies and psychosis. So thanks very much for the opportunity to speak. I'd just like to say thank you to all my colleagues who have helped me um, in terms of both research and in, in uh, the clinical work going on in this area. And I'd be happy to take some questions. Thank you. Oh, that was a really good illuminating talk, but I'm sorry that Tom can't be with us, but if you want to put some questions to him on the chat, he's promised that um, he will look at, and look, and look at them and answer them later. So we've got um, eight or nine minutes left of the symposium, and I'd like to bring David Okai back, um, as we didn't have a chance to have a Q&A with him, so hopefully you'll be, able to pre you'll be prepared to uh, answer some of our questions. David, and there's there's two up already, one from Daruj again, and he says regarding the BRAC stage, it started with olfactory disturbance, so BRAC points to both the medulla and the olfactory bulb being involved early. So he, he wants to know how common do patients with PD experience olfactory hallucinations, and if not, why? I think you're mute, David. I was, I was saying it's a fascinating question. You know, if you typed an anosmia sort of two years ago, uh, you'd come up with Parkinson's as the next search term, whereas now, of course, if you type it in, COVID comes up as top of the list. Um, I think it's important to recognise that there is not a, it's not anosmia disorder, yes, anosmia disorder, no. It's a spectrum of um, severity of, of, of a loss of smell. And then the other question is whether, is how that relates to uh, population norms for those who are in the elderly. So those two things are key. And so in the literature today, you know, the, the, the variability of the prevalence has been quite high based on uh, a, a failure to recognize those. But um, the, most, the, the best study is, is a German study, which was done around sort of 2008 or 2010 or something along those lines, uh, which found that if you, ate, if you adjusted for those norms, um, probably 75% had a degree of anosmia and 50% of that 75% had um, a, a full anos anosmic uh, state, whereas the other 50% had, you know, some reduction in their, in their smell. Um, but yet, it, it is, a, you still get 
um, neurologists, you know, probably those from the Queen Square who walk around with all these smelling things because, uh, you know, that would be viewed as a relatively sensitive uh, sort of uh, test from that perspective. Yes, but they don't hallucinate, do they, uh, Parkinson's disease patients? It's probably because um, it's actually a lack of sensory input, not an increased sensory input. So there's nothing really to hallucinate about because they're not smelling mm. anything, I suppose, is one, yes. is yeah, one yeah. answer. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So we've got another question from uh, Keith Wofford asking, why do we not use pimavanserin? Great question, which is approved for this indication. <laughs> Yeah, it's not licensed uh, in the UK, uh, so first it would need FDA approval, and then uh, then NICE would have to look at it as well. So there'd be at least two steps, I think, to people using it. I think if it was licensed, people would be using it um, yeah. because it oftentimes serves as a gap for a subset of patients who either can't uh, are, are over sedated on quetiapine or, or for whatever reason can't tolerate uh, rivastigmine. The most common side effect from rivastigmine is usually nausea, but there's some cardiac concerns as well. So it would fist, it could, oh, actually, yeah, though, Pimavanserin also has some QTC prolongation properties, so maybe it's not as simple as I'm suggesting. Well, so that's why the Ondansetron study, the Top Hat study, was uh, initiated, because we, it doesn't look as if we're going to get Pimavanserin in the UK, because I think it's quite expensive. And Ondansetron is a relatively cheap compound that's been around a lot, and that also works through 5-HT system. So I think that was the basis of um, Suzanne deciding that maybe a trial of a dance tram would be would work. So fingers crossed about that. It is very expensive actually, you're right. <laughs> so moving on um, from Adam, this is <laughs> you're getting all the difficult questions. Um, why do we need typically much higher clozapine doses for schizophrenia and lower doses for PD? psychosis both of which are explicable by dopamine yeah i, I think the most thing the, the, the most important thing to re remember from that perspective is clozapine dose doesn't only work on dopaminergic uh, uh, neurons uh, it works on a whole um uh, breadth of uh, receptors and subreceptors both relevant to 5-ht and you know sort of several other um, aspects of the monoamine um function um, so that's the first thing the second thing is, I, I mean, but, but to be honest, I don't, I don't know. I think um, organic conditions on the whole and neuropsychiatry on the whole is probably a more rewarding uh, subspecialty than some other subspecialties of psychiatry because our organic patients do seem to respond um, uh, better to, to psychotropics, um, at least in the earlier stages of their conditions. So, yeah, it, it'd be easy to speculate that it is a, a, a pure, uh, you know, schizophrenia itself is a heterogeneous condition. And it would be easy to speculate that the it's a more homoge homogenized uh, process in the context of uh, uh, the known pathology and association with motoric dysfunction in the context of dopamine. And th therein probably lies the answer. But I don't think anyone knows for certain. Yes. There's something magical about clozapine, I always think. Um, yeah. It just melts away their psychosis and Parkinson's disease at very low, very low doses. And even in schizophrenia, it's the best antipsychotic we have, um, but we can't prescribe it to everybody because of the, the risks and the expense of monitoring. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe I'm just looking while I look uh, at the questions. Maybe, David, maybe we, because this is, a, this is an educational session, um, and I'm sure um, a lot of neurologists um, well, would be concerned about where you'd start if, you, if you've got a psychotic patient with, with uh, Parkinson's disease presenting. The um, people use quetiapine, don't they, because it's harmless. But in your experience, do you think it's really an effective antipsychotic? Yeah, um, I, do. I mean, I think um, it's, it's, you know, the horses for courses is an unfair term. I think medicine works on um, a systematized approach to um, a patient's care. Uh, and then there are those who are in specialist centers who, you know, f by virtue of their expertise, can bypass some of the standard things based on what they might um, need. So, for example, if you need treat to treat someone in an inpatient setting, you might move, opt, you might have a lower threshold for moving to a, a medication that you feel to be more potent and likely to be more effective for a range of reasons. 
Um, and so uh, it makes sense in that context to trial um, either quetiapine or rivastigmine dependent on the patient demographic in the first instance. I guess the data probably shows that it's worth a try, don't hold your breath, that it's going to work because you should have in your mind a, a low threshold for moving on to the next stage of care. But if you're going to do that, don't opt for olanzapine because quetiapine didn't work or, or risperidone. Move on to something that has an evidence base behind it, such as clozapine. Um, would, would probably be the, the way that I would best uh, best see it. But you know, we we, we had a large MDT um, in, in Oxford, and it, we were able to manage a quite a large load of patients in the context of that MDT. And you know, not all, they wouldn't all come back saying could I didn't work that one, could I didn't work that, could I didn't work for that one, that, that patient, that patient, that patient. You know, um, uh, it, it worked reasonably well for a, a proportion of patients. And you know, oftentimes there's probably something about. Uh, the stage of of, of their, the progression of their of their illness, for instance, that might might in, influence that and how they're presenting to to my secondary care service at the time versus tertiary. I think if they've got deep brain stimulation, that protects the motor system, so you can have you can be a bit more brave, yeah. and uh, prescribe a more potent antipsychotic. Because you know you've got the DBS, so I'll keep their motor system going. And, yeah. 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 And from the psychiatry perspective, of course, they're scared about clozapine and someone who might be 65 plus with a comorbidity that they might, uh, that a psychiatrist might be less familiar with, such as Parkinson's, because they, they've seen, you know, sort of some of the side effects that the younger um, individuals can get on uh, on it. But the low, doses are so low that you, you're not so worried about things like, um, you know, sort of hypotension or, or you know, the tachycardia syndromes. Uh, you know, so, or, or that you might get in, in, in the other groups. Of course, so many of the side effects are idiosyncratic, but uh, they still seem to be to, to be relatively well tolerated. Thanks very much. And that brings us to time. We've got some questions about the autoimmune that I'm going to um, ask Thomas to, Tom Pollack to look at when he's feeling better. But thank you very much, David, and I'm glad you've got a chance to answer some of the questions. So that's the end of the symposium. I hope everybody en enjoyed it. I thought that the, the topics are really interesting and hopefully in years to come, we'll be able to answer some of the very tricky questions that we were asked today. So close the symposium now and goodbye, everybody. Have a nice weekend. <laughs>